In a realm of light and shadow, Villainer Everdark, at one time a dedicated but aging wizard of his realm, had fallen into the abyss of the Forbidden, unlocking the secrets of unholy immortality along this dark path. Driven by the fear of his own mortality, he was not ready to leave this mortal coil. And so the wizard, formerly known as Anovir, successfully unlocked the secrets of Lichdom and completed the vile ritual, the result morphing his mortal form into this a monstrous, decaying, necromantic lich robed in death and darkness. His humanity, now shed like an old serpent's skin, lay forgotten in his foreboding and transformed obsidian tower nestled among the spiraling peaks of the cold rock mountains. His new form, a withered and ever-wasting skeletal specter, was an abomination, by any means a parody of life and a harbinger of dread and doom. But mere eternal life would no longer sate Villainer's unholy appetite. His hollow gaze was set upon the town of Brightwater, a morsel of innocence nestled under his now wicked shadow. Villainer, now a lord wielding the power of anguish and sorrow, desired subjects, servants, worshippers. For what is a lord without his kingdom, a dominion of dread and decay? Yes, a kingdom he should have. With the lifeblood of Brightwater as its dark genesis. Clad in an aura of pulsating darkness, Villainer descended upon the unsuspecting town. As he drew closer, the trees blackened and the very air around him seemed to recoil, curdling into a chilling tempest that blotted out the sun and shrouded the innocent town in an unnatural dusk. Villainer's osseous hand weaved a symphony of ruin, casting a pestilent curse over the verdant town. Bountiful harvests turned to dust, the once vibrant water sources turned dark and fetid with disease, and a languid despair crept into the hearts of its very citizens. Joyous laughter was snuffed out, leaving only the dirge-like chiming of funeral bells echoing through the dense, bleak air. But the true horror was yet to come. Villainer called again upon his abyssal dark powers, ensnaring the souls of the tormented townsfolk in an invisible chain of necrotic energy, a shroud of certain demise. Their wails echoed in the dark spectral winds as the very life force visibly drained from their innocent, terrified faces. The result twisting their bodies into gaunt, decayed shells of animated death, their spirits doomed to languish in a ghastly twilight caught between existence and oblivion. As the residents of Brightwater slowly but collectively transformed, shackled in the holy binds of torment, Villainer commenced his grand orchestration, the Resurrection. His skeletal fingers crackled with an unholy energy as he shattered the boundary between life and death, seizing upon the restful dead with a vile force, mutating the souls of Brightwater cemeteries and mausoleums into his own instruments of pure darkness. The ground cracking and churning as decayed fingers and flesh-stripped limbs slowly uprooted the soft, earthly home above them as they answered their master's call. The once-loved deceased faces of Brightwater now twisted into an aberrant mockery of life, their eyes hollow and vacant, reflecting the abyssal visage of their new lich lord. Villainer smiled wickedly. Subjects and a kingdom he will have. What comes next? Brightwater, once a beacon of life and joy, now a grisly citadel of death and despair, the heart of Villainer's new, undead kingdom. Amid the sickening silence of his reign, he could hear the lamenting hymn of future conquest. His kingdom was but in its grim infancy, a mere preview of his harrowing and growing power. The epoch of Villainer Everdark had only just begun, ushering in an era of unending night and perpetual terror. Welcome adventurers, I'm Rich and this is Riches and Liches, dedicated to dungeons, dragons, and tales of lore. 
This has been a long time coming, but I'm so glad you joined me today as we continue our lore series on the dreaded and versatile Lich. The first volume in this series was actually the first video this young channel ever produced. And if you made it this far, all I can say is thank you. Thank you for the support, most certainly, but also just the patience making it through that first video. I, I knew so little about producing videos that first week, and man, does it show. <laughs> I know it's probably not in my best interest to bash my own videos, and to be fair, um, to myself, I guess, uh, the content is solid. It's the delivery and production that really scream remaster, which will happen at some point. But if you're a regular to this channel, you know we've got a lot of awesome stuff going on, so, you know, priorities. I was actually told multiple times by multiple creators when I started that I will, with zero doubt, look back upon my first videos and cringe horribly. That it happens to all, and I should just view it as a barometer for improvement. Uh, in any event, thank you so much for sticking around. I hope you have seen that improvement and are as excited as I am to get talking about the namesake of the channel, once again, The Lich. Okay, let's talk about what's in store with these last two Lich volumes as we close out this five-part series. In volumes one and two, we covered the real world and in-game lore of The Lich, and if you've not seen those videos yet, uh, look above you and to your right, you should see a couple of link cards flashing up there taking you to those respective videos. We also dedicated the entirety of Volume 3 to the legendary artifact and creative, if sometimes contrived, plot device, the Phylactery. And again, you can find that link above you right about now. Uh, I'll also place all three links in the description below. In these two remaining volumes, we will endeavor to take all that we have learned thus far and work to define and create the ultimate lich for your next adventure or campaign, and we're going to break a few rules and boundaries along the way. And we'll do so with a heavy lean to customization and homebrew to ensure your lich is like nothing your table has seen before. We're going to end up with something approaching close to three hours of final product on this lich, and ten times that in terms of research and production time. So please consider supporting my work with a YouTube or Patreon subscription or a super thanks so that I can do this full time at some point in the future and ensure content for years to come. Thank you. Uh, heavy Homebrew is in our future, so let's get at it. Welcome to Lich Lore Volume 4. One question I see asked often among fellow Dungeon Masters is how to mitigate those players who metagame by researching monster manuals and arriving at the table with a cheat code of noted information that their character would have no knowledge of surrounding a specific creature or encounter. And I'm sure a lot of listening Dungeon and Game Masters would just flat out say, that player's bad for the table. That goes against the very spirit of the game. My response to that is, while you're not wrong, I've never worried about it. Not because I didn't never have players like that, perhaps I did, I'm honestly not sure, but because I rarely, if ever, used a bog standard bone stock lifted straight from a book creature. I mean, a pack of goblins or kobolds, sure. But anything of significance, starting with even a low level kobold pack leader, a goblin boss, or even a rat prince? Nope, all homebrew. And for a lich, the chances I ever use one straight from the book, 0.0. 0. <laughs> Monster manuals are, at least to me, a framework, an inspiration, and they're a guide to be used to tune my own creations. Now, you may not feel the same, and that's perfectly fine. My way is certainly not the only way, and might even be in the minority. But you might consider this informal but imaginative approach the next time you plan to run a lich. And if you do enjoy the more customizable, world-building aspects of the game, especially as it pertains to the Lich, then these last two volumes you should find both enlightening and useful, and maybe entertaining as well. But before we even begin to create our custom and memorable Lich together, there are a few things that you should seriously consider to frame your Lich-based campaign. While perhaps not a fundamental principle for some, I would disagree, but for me personally, I stridently abide by a few core tenets that are essential for any lich creation of my own that I place into a world. 
First, the Lich should always, without fail, be regarded as a long-term villain. Due to their prestige as a high-end adversary, the work and imagination you're putting into its creation, and of course the fact that it's a Lich, it's immortal, all mean that your Lich is meant to be a recurring villain. By the time your DM says roll for initiative, the party should have had numerous interactions with your Lich and or his Agents of Darkness, all in preparation for that very moment. The Lich would rarely, if ever, be a surprise villain to a party by the time of a final encounter. The Lich is highly influential to the realm in which it resides, and everything around the party from the demeanor and attitude of the people in the surrounding areas, the agents and associated henchmen and minions, to the very landscape and telltale regional effects, they should all give an ever-escalating set of clues to the party beginning very early in their adventure. Additionally, and factoring the intended length of your campaign, it would not be at all abnormal for your party to learn of the Lich's presence or even have non-combat interactions or encounters at far earlier levels than they might ever realistically expect to defeat a Lich. This has the net positive effect of arming your party with motivation, some clear direction, and a primary focus for their activities as they advance their story. This is a simple and direct way of keeping the party moving down the right path in the right direction and at the intended trajectory without the use of any railroading, which I personally despise. Second, discovery is critical, dare I say a requirement to defeating a Lich. Remember that whole immortality thing? If we've built our Lich properly, then at a challenge rating of say 22, in the lair that we're going to build with all its traps, regional effects, and lair actions, if you just dropped a group of four level 20 heroes in front of that lich in that lair, it should be near certain defeat for your party. Now, I hear you say, gas, pizzah, what are you talking about? Well, that's correct, but only because in that truly terrible and very unlikely scenario, I do hope no DM ever does that to a table, the party did not make or complete their journey of discovery in order to acquire all the relevant and crucial information, artifacts, and even powers that will arm them for success. Given that your Lich should, in almost all campaign scenarios, be the focus, the central figure and end goal, at least for a lengthy period of time, now perhaps you have grander plans after a Lich's defeat in an all-encompassing world campaign, and that's great, that's totally fine. But for a good number of chapters, or in this narrative arc, shall we say, the Lich should always be the driving force. And as such, a vast majority of the activities your party will undertake should include breadcrumbs to critical events, interactions, encounters, and the acquisition and discovery of important information, items, and perhaps even those secret powers each of which will have a compounding effect and accumulate to both prepare and empower the party to end this unholy terror that is plaguing your realm. For example, we spent all of Volume 3 on the phylactery, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, other than to say part of the early campaign should revolve around uncovering the secrets of the Lich, and one of those secrets being specific to the phylactery. Many of the early and mid-game quests interactions and encounters should revolve around acquiring facets of knowledge for your party to begin to piece together. From what form does it take, that in and of itself is a highly guarded secret, to where is it located, what powers does it possess, what is its weaknesses and how can it be acquired and or destroyed. And it is here in these early stages that you will create some amazing quest arcs that the party can undertake to begin the process of diminishing the power of your Lich. As a DM, I cannot think of many, or really any, valid in-game Lich combat encounter scenarios where the party is not well armed with enough information to at least make an educated guess on the important aspects of that phylactery, potential form, location, powers, weaknesses, etc. Otherwise, you're just dooming your party to failure, and that could be memorable, but for all the wrong reasons. And finally, to put a finer point on this journey of discovery, the party should not be expected to do this alone. And I'm not talking about combat necessarily, although adding NPCs to certain combat encounters, or even to the final Lich battle is certainly a tool you have as a dungeon master. 
but I'm referring to the potential need for the party to make alliances over the course of the adventure, many only temporary, but still critical. These alliances can lead to interesting dynamics and even tough, maybe even morality-based choices. As a quick example I've used in the past from an older campaign of mine, the party met a less than honorable NPC who happened to possess important information about a phylactery that the party needed. This villainous NPC offered this knowledge, but at a cost. He wanted to exchange the information for the party's engagement in some unsavory activities on his behalf. In my specific campaign, this NPC was certainly villainous, but he wasn't evil, certainly not in the unholy dark powers enslave the realm sort of way. He was the leader of an underground crime syndicate, and he wanted the party to either use their influence or brute force to free an associate of his from a cell in a dungeon of a nearby kingdom. My party had several options, ranging from declining or accepting the offer face value as is, to weighing the morality value of this clearly lesser evil, or negotiating terms, bribing with gold, all the way to their own trickery, or even threatening or attacking the NPC. And this is just one simple example. We'll dive into more of this type of homebrew in Volume 5, but I mention it because it brings up another important point the DM should always be mindful of. In my scenario, there were literally a half dozen options the party had just in deciding on their response to the NPC. As a dungeon master, you need to be able to seamlessly integrate these decision branches that are available to the party in order to avoid dead ends or the need to create an ad hoc contrivance to open a path that was inadvertently closed by an unpredictable player group. We've all been through that. In my case, the NPC did indeed have information, but it could be acquired from other sources. So no matter what the party decided or how they reacted, the breadcrumb trail to this knowledge that I deemed crucial still existed. Look, every DM knows the party will, without fail, surprise you with their actions. I actually find that quite endearing. And while you cannot predict or forecast these decisions with any accuracy, try as we might, it's about on par with predicting the weather. You can, however, create multiple sources and multiple paths to reach your intended objectives, all to keep your player's story in frame and on course. As we continue our discussion on one of the most versatile villains in all of Dungeons & Dragons, hopefully I have impressed upon you through these previous three volumes that creating a memorable lich is not about slapping some skeletal wizard in a dark robe, giving him some special magic, and saying, roll for initiative. In fact, as I stated earlier, but cannot overstate, by the time you do tell the party to roll for initiative, if done correctly, you've already exhausted three-fourths of your creative effort you put into the Lich to begin with. And just like how you don't grab a book and flip it to the last chapter, the culmination of a Lich encounter should have ample story, lore, and related cumulative encounters and interactions, all designed to empower the party and leading to this final moment that if done properly will end, win or lose, in a fantastic and unforgettable experience. So as we begin to create our Lich in these last two volumes, it all starts with the backstory. The life, well, unlife, of your Lich begins with their past. And defining your Lich's backstory should be at the top of your list of things to do first in the creation process. Developing a solid and intriguing backstory for your Lich is a critical step for so many reasons. Not only will it serve as a foundation for the Lich's motivations and ambitions, but it also contributes to the depth and the richness of your campaign's narrative. It ensures the Lich feels alive and ever-present, and not like you just pulled up a stat block for a tactical combat the moment a party crosses some fictional threshold. You know, like an early video game. So where do we start? Well, if you truly want to create an original and organic Lich or Lich variant for your table, and you have an open mind for the power and flexibility of homebrew, then the best way I have found is to begin with a blank slate. That means no concept or preconceived notion of your lich at this point. And then, with that basis, start outlining the mortal life of your subject, long before their transformation to the dark powers. A proper and engaging backstory from their 
race, or even species, to their upbringing and significant life events that lead up to the reasons that immortality was sought in this dark and terrible way, will frame so many facets of the Lich's eventual characteristics and personality that you'll find that the path to creating your Lich suddenly becomes much more clear, almost writing itself. And I do this with just two questions, which, while technically true, is honestly kind of clickbaity. But stick with me, it will all become clear. But the first question that we have to ask is, what did this person do as a mortal? This question, in some respects, is asking what class your mortal was in life. But I really try to avoid using that word class because we don't want to be constrained in that way. While we do want to get an idea of their skills and potential powers that they had as a mortal, as that's going to inform what kind of lich we are creating, we definitely don't want to be bound to a rule as written 5e class because it mostly doesn't apply. Let me explain. For example, maybe your lich was an actual cleric, a druid, or an all too typical wizard. Okay, fair enough, that's pretty straightforward. But perhaps they were a lord of a small kingdom, a corrupt politician, or a sea captain. Those are not classes, but they're still relative and very important in our creation process. Now let's take it in another direction. What if he or she was a mere historian, a world traveler, a writer, an alchemist, or even a court jester? All of these present dramatic shifts in the makeup and chemistry of your lich, and for me, this one piece of information will start to speak to me. Uh, proverbially, I'm not crazy, I swear. But I do find that once I have answered that question, it becomes so much easier to answer the second question why they sought this immortality in the first place. Okay, let's put all of this into action. Feel free to work alongside with me and even comment on what you came up with in our sample scenario. So what did this person do as a mortal? I was actually super tempted to go with Jester here, <laughs> but I feel like I would catch a wrath of your comments because admittedly that's super niche. But Let's pick the druid type, a stark contrast indeed, which is why I'm choosing it. I really want to stretch the boundaries in order to illustrate how easy it can be. I mean, if we can turn a druid into a believable lich, then we can convert just about anything else. Because the second I say druid, you instantly think of the class and start to see all the tricks and traps that using the class, quote, end quote, does to your brain. Druids are all about the natural cycle of life and death and are, in fact, diametrically opposed to about everything that comes to mind when you think of a lich, from their motivations to their actual physical form. Remember, I said have an open mind. So let's think less about druid as a class and more about someone that has druidic leanings, passions, maybe even some skills and powers. So a druidic human, passionate about all things nature and living in a large, thriving kingdom that is going through a population boom, ever-expanding, constant construction, noisy. Think everything in opposition to the calm, serene, and organic nature, no pun intended, of the surrounding wilderness. A wilderness that is ever-shrinking with this human expansion. And now we can ask ourselves why they sought this immortality. Perhaps he or she grew increasingly frustrated with the culling of the wilderness around the realm. In their adolescent life, they studied to become a druid, maybe gain some druidic powers. Maybe they became a full-fledged druid. That's up to you. You decide. Perhaps they even began to worship a deity or a demigod like Valerian from the third edition or Shantia from Forgotten Realms. Again, take your pick. Some years later, however, this druid, at whatever level of engagement you chose, discovers some secrets of an ancient forest that is now threatened by this ever-growing kingdom and their reckless encroachment, the relentless logging of the forests, and the increased pollution of the streams, rivers, and lakes. This druid prays to his or her deity or god, but nothing changes. Now fast forward many years later. This human druid has become elderly, and the machinations of human progress and expansion, along with their disregard for the forest your druid holds dear, weigh heavily upon him or her. With a lifespan now limited by their human mortality and believing themselves powerless to protect and heal this ancient wilderness, 
The druid has become driven, fanatically so, to save this forest. So consumed are they with this sole purpose that they are blind to any repercussions or collateral damage they may cause or any sacrifice they may need to make. And it is in this fevered condition that they seek immortality by any means necessary in order to become the eternal protector of this grove. And it is here that we begin to provide informed answers to the final questions that will form our Lich or Lich variant. So how did they achieve their immortality? Perhaps they were able to unlock a secret to tap into the elemental chaos to gain a form of druidic lichdom. Perhaps a greater devil found this an irresistible opportunity to make a Faustian pact. Or maybe the demon prince Orcus, the patron of most liches, saw this as a unique opportunity to spread chaos across the realm at the bargain basement price of saving a meaningless forest he cared little for anyway. Whatever path you choose, you now have a solid framework, the bones, if you will, of a druidic slash elemental lich. One that will look and act decidedly different than your typical wizard or grim reaper lich stereotype, instead showing the darker side of nature in this form as a protector of a dark grove by any means necessary. But there are still lots of blanks we need to fill in to complete our druid lich, and we'll do that in volume 5. From the phylactery and the Lich's innate and special powers, to some unique lairs and lair actions, and even some more homebrew takes on the Lichdom process specific to a druid. As well as any questions you might have, be sure to let me know and I'll try to answer them in our finale to this series. And if we have time, maybe even a few more non-druid Lich variants. Do you have one in particular you'd like to see us homebrew in Volume 5? comment below and let me know. If you do, I'll put it in a poll. And if we get enough comments on it, you'll then force me to make sure we cover a second non-Druid Lich variant. Maybe that Jester Lich, or how about a Cleric? It's, it's all up to you. But that concludes Volume 4. I do hope it was worth the wait, and I promise Volume 5 will not take as long. I hope you'll join me there and contribute. I love the interaction. Please consider following me on Twitter at Riches and Liches, checking out our Patreon, Discord, YouTube channel memberships for as little as two bucks or a super thanks. The equivalent of buying that man a drink at the local tavern for a job well done. And if you feel like I earned it, sub and ring that bell to help me grow this amazing community. And until next time, remember, the only limitation at your table is your imagination. <laughs>